sick and tired of hearing things from uptight, short-sighted, narrow-minded hypocrites. All I want is the truth. Just give me some truth. I've had enough of reading things by new psychotic, big-headed politics. It's the 20th of April, 2011, and I'm here with Bill Ryan from Project Avalon and we're going to do an interview about his life and his goals and his vision for the planet. So Bill, can you tell me a little bit about your early years? A little bit about my early years? Okay. I'll give you the compressed version. Um, I'm, I'm British, I was born in London, I was taken off to West Africa by my parents at, as a babe in arms and I had a wonderful exotic tropical upbringing until I was about eight years old where when I was driving through the rainforest in the back of my dad's Land Rover watching the monkeys swinging from the trees I thought that all this was normal and that kind of spirit of adventure the love of the great outdoors the love of the forest the love of the animals the love of exotic places and the love of Africa actually has never really left me since then it was a very formative experience and um, I went back to England when I was eight years old basically to get my education because up until then I hadn't done anything at all I was I went to school in a few little tiny places didn't really learn much I used to read a lot um, but I didn't actually receive any formal schooling so my education started in England when I was eight years old and uh, since then I've loved to return to Africa at every possible opportunity for any reason or or no reason and those of you who've been there uh, may understand that so what else would you like to know you need to guide me through here otherwise I'll talk for hours about my childhood right uh, well I'm really interested in what age or who influenced you to look beyond what's real what people will con consider to be real within the culture that we're living in to look beyond and see the bigger picture okay the simple answer to that is, I don't know, but it's always been with me. I've always questioned things. I was always curious, even as a little boy, in, in, in interesting stories, stories of the unexplained. I was very open-minded about all kinds of things. I remember when I was a little five-year-old boy, I used to climb a tree in the garden in Ghana, in West Africa, and I used to pretend that this was my spaceship. And when I was eight years old, this is a funny little story. When I was eight years old um, and I went back to school, went to school in England, the teacher asked us all to write a story and all the other little children were writing stories about their puppy dog or their day by the seaside and young Bill Ryan, eight years old, wanted to write about ghosts and flying saucers and my teacher wouldn't let me. And so this was my first experience of the cover-up. It, right. it was quite interesting. I have no idea why I wanted to write about ghosts and flying saucers when I was eight years old. I don't know what I knew. I probably didn't know anything, but I know that I was enthusiastic. I really wanted to write something. This little kid wanting to communicate to the world. And my teacher stopped me. Uh, didn't stop my interest, though, because all throughout um, my... Um, when I was eight, nine, ten, throughout my teenage years, I would devour books on the the paranormal. I used to get them out of the library. I saved up my pocket money to read Eric von Däniken's Chariots of the Gods. Many of you watching this will maybe identify with that if that was one of your first books to to really point at the fact that there's some very strange things that have happened on planet Earth that are just swept aside by the mainstream media, and certainly by the time I was, I was a young teenager, it was very obvious to me that we weren't being told the truth. And I was so curious, I wanted to know about everything. And I was, um, when I was about 14 or 15, I decided that I wanted to be an astrophysicist because I figured out that the way to find out about life, the universe and everything and why we're all here and what's going on and why is there anything happening anyway, was to look through a telescope and to figure out the, the basic principles of cosmology. I thought if you look through a telescope and did a lot of math, then you can get all the answers. 
a following on from Einstein and the quantum physicists and the um, and, and, and the great cosmologist and astrophysicist of the time, Fred Hoyle was a hero of mine, and so on and so forth. So that's how come I ended up studying math and I went to university to study math and then I realized when I was at university that what one has to do is you've got to turn the telescope around. This is a metaphor. You turn the telescope around, you don't look outside to get the answers, you look inside. Because um, as uh, Cat Stevens sang, the answer lies within not out there at the other end of a telescope. And so that then started my own journey, and this was something that will resonate with a lot of people watching this. That started my journey, which was a kind of personal development journey, a spiritual growth journey, that, um, that really led me to follow the string trail of, of who I was. Who is this being who I call I, who's looking out from my eyes into the universe, this, this viewpoint, this platform that absorbs information and looks out, who is that, where does it come from, what's the difference between me and all the other people who have the same experience looking out from, from their eyes, how did all of that happen, and what's the relationship between that and everything that we see out there in the cosmos when we look out through our telescope, and kind of marrying this sort of this, this, this personal spiritual picture, all of those big internal questions with all of those big external questions has been a thread that's run through my life, I guess, and has taken me right through until the present moment. You mentioned before um, that you had actually worked for quite a long time um, inspiring people before you got involved in the alternative media. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> It's interesting because there are one or two um, people who are sort of surprised, if you like, at a at a a point which I've reached now. This is this is April 2011, and this is something which I would like this interview to be at least partially about, which is that having founded Project Camelot with Kerry Cassidy in uh, in April 2006, pretty much exactly five years ago. That was all about providing information for people because people were starved of information. They were confused, we have been lied to, we're having information withheld from us and altered by the mainstream media. Our governments want to keep us in the dark for all kinds of interesting reasons. Many people watching this will be totally aware of that. And so Project Camelot, founded five years ago, was a whistleblowing website. And that's just a, 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 a condensed form for, of of saying that we wanted to present as much truth laid out on this big buffet table of all these things that you can help yourself to, you can look at this, you can talk about super soldiers, you can look at the the Mars base, you can look at indigo children, you can look at paranormal abilities, you can look at what may have happened back with the Roswell incident, you can look at the whole thing. And the idea was to present this this sort of huge mosaic of information which was which um, most of which you wouldn't find in one in one place in a kind of one-stop shop, as it were. So this was the informational mission that Kerry Cassidy and myself had, and we've got hundreds of hours of video out there on the internet. We've actually we've we've lost count. Between us now, it must be over 200 hours of testimony from some very high quality people, some very interesting people, some very smart people, some very controversial people, some very startling information. And we presented this all, saying, look, look at all of this. You won't see this stuff on CNN. It wasn't the only place you could find it, but we wanted to put it all in one place for people. Okay. Now, as long ago as two years ago, Kerry Cassidy and I were talking about the fact that maybe our work was pretty much done, in the sense that Maybe there are details of this information which, uh, which, which you could drill down further into forever is necessary. Even now, for example, on the 9-11 forums and the 9-11 websites, you have people arguing and discussing and debating with each other about what it was that hit the Pentagon and what it was that took down the, the two towers, uh, the, the twin towers. Was it, was it thermite or thermate or a, or a space-based weapon or what? And actually, that's interesting, 
and we need to get to the bottom of that information in the end, but maybe in the big picture it's not that important. The fact is it was a false flag event. That's all you need to know in order to move on, to take that jigsaw puzzle piece, and then to, and then to fit that into the big mosaic of what is going on on this planet, why are we being lied to, who are we, why are they doing to this to us, and, 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 and what is our position in the cosmos here that makes it so important for us to be dumbed down, lied to, controlled and suppressed every minute of every day. Why would they do that? It's a very, very valuable question to ask. So, what I'm saying there is that we've got enough information out there already, and there's a lot on the, inf on the internet. There are many people who are doing this work. Um, it's quite confusing, but a lot of the information is already out there. So now what we want is inspiration. People need to get in touch with their missions, they need to get in touch with their energy, they need to get in touch with the reason why they're here on this planet. Why do they incarnate here this lifetime? There are many people who write to us. They know that there's something about themselves that they can't quite remember, that they can't quite get in touch with. They know that, uh, that they're here on a mission for a purpose and they can't quite remember what it was. They feel energized, they feel that there's something they have to do. and. There are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are in this position. Many of them write to us. And so something that excites me, and it's important to say that, because if somebody's talking to me and they say, well, what should I do with my life? I reflect that back to them and I say, well, what is it that you're passionate about? What do you get excited about? What do you wake up in the morning thinking about? What do you care about? What do you talk about to anyone who's willing to listen? And that'll give you a clue as to what it is you should be doing. And what it is that excites me, and what it is that gets me up in the morning, and, and, and what it is that I want to talk about, what it is that I want to talk about now, is, is, is it's about what is it that, that, that we can do together where we can get the synergy, we can, we can extract the potential synergy of people working together, people inspiring each other, people working in, 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 in teams and alliances and networks all over the world. We don't have billions of dollars, but we may have something else. We may have, we may have a lot of forces behind us. We may have a lot of benevolent forces behind us. We may have something that, for lack of any better word, you could call the human spirit. Which, if it is, if it's, if it's, if it's properly harnessed, and when I say harnessed, I, I'm talking about the idea of of a whole bunch of horses pulling a carriage harnessed together in the same direction. If this is harnessed, then we have a lot of power there. And one of the things that's going on in the alternative media, the alternative community, is that there's a lot of division. There's a lot of fragmentation. There are. Um, a lot of people who are pulling in different directions, not working as efficiently as they could do. I want to get people working together. I want to support that process. I want to energize and inspire individuals. And so that's, that's where I am right now. Now, you asked me a few minutes ago about what it was that I was doing quite a long time ago. Because some people are saying, well, how come Bill Ryan has changed his direction? Well, Bill Ryan hasn't changed his direction at all. Bill Ryan was doing this quite a long time ago. Because I used to run um, team building, team development, personal development, executive training courses. It's, it's all in a kind of big, big, big box of stuff that's closely related together. Back in the, in the early 1980s, I started doing this work. And I was working with teams of managers and executives and sometimes young people as well in business and industry in the UK. But I wasn't wearing a suit and tie. I was operating very informally. This was working as an opportunity to work with, with, with individuals to help them become, for, for lack of a better word, to help them become better people or to help them to become the people that they wanted to become, they knew was inside them. It wasn't about fulfilling any corporate agenda, but it was about at the end of a five or a six day program, if somebody went back, went home at the end of that week, and they became, or they realized that they were able to be 
a better husband, a better wife, a better mother, a better father, a better son, a better daughter, a better employer, a better citizen, um, because there was something inside them that was operating to a much richer potential, what some people might these days, dare I say it, call a higher vibration, then everybody wins. Um, we weren't necessarily working to specific goals, but by, but by supporting those individuals in really accessing their potential, and this, this is a kind of nod back to what in the, the 60s and 70s used to be called the, the human potential movement. It's a great name. Um, I was really working on, at, at the tail end of that. I was surfing on that wave. I had a lot of personal experiences at that time that really, uh, that I really learned an awful lot from. And I did everything I could do to pass this on. So although I was working in the corporate world, this was what I was doing in a, in a kind of stealth mode, was I was working directly with these individuals to help them develop themselves in extraordinary ways. And, 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 and this has always been my passion, to be an educator. When I was, uh, I can't remember, when I was 21 or 22 or something, after I left university, I became a school teacher for, for a couple of years, which was... Uh, <laughs> which didn't work out at all, I, I realized very quickly that I was an indirect bastion of the establishment, that what schools were, were there were just ways of, of, of institutionalize, institutionalizing and socializing children to be obedient and to conform and to think in certain regimented ways. Whatever schools might think, somebody, usually people who are successful in the education system, are people who've learnt to behave in a certain way. They get rewarded for that, just like Pavlov's dogs, and then they're actually being groomed to go into mainstream society and do everything that mainstream society wants. The kids who question things, the, qu the kids who are disobedient, the kids who are overly creative, the kids who want to do things in their own way, who are, are, are spirited and strong and, and, and maverick, are not usually the kids who are rewarded by the school system. I saw this at first hand. I got out of the school system as fast as I possibly could do because I was with those kids who were doing that. I was rooting for them all the way. And um, for a while I was confused because I had this passion to be an educator and yet I thought, well, here I am being an educator and this isn't what I came here for. And I even felt bad about it for a little while because I just kind of ran out of the door. I didn't want to have anything to do with the school system. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I don't have the courage. Maybe I don't have the strength. Maybe I should hang in there like, like, like some teachers do. And that was another way in which I came full circle, because years later I was working with people in what I would call a real, really educating themselves, not in terms of stuffing them with information like Christmas turkeys, but by inspiring them to, to do the things that schools don't teach which is how to work with people, how to solve problems, how to be creative, how to, how to reach inside themselves to access the higher human abilities. Um, and we used to do this using uh, outdoor activities and team building games, and we used to set up whole kind of micro universes of, 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 of challenge and fun and problem solving and working together that would sometimes last several days. Um, like they'd have a start and they'd go into this whole imaginary role play drama and then they'd come out of it and then we'd all sit around eating tea and cakes and we'd talk about all of this and then they'd, they'd, they'd share what they'd learned, they'd talk about the mistakes they made, the, how they were challenged, how they felt in certain situations when they felt under pressure, trying to solve a problem in the middle of the night when they wanted to communicate with somebody and they couldn't because etc, etc, etc. Um, that's a whole separate topic because we had an awful lot of fun doing that stuff and then applied into their lives again. So enough of that but what's happening here with with myself is I'm kind of coming full circle I'm kind of coming back to my roots I'm 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 impassioned by my own desire to work with people directly so that what I see in front of me is somebody who's who's shining 
who is energizing, who is activating, who's, 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 who's waking up in the morning thinking, wow, I'm looking at the world now differently from the way that I was looking at it yesterday, and what can I do now? That for me is the most rewarding experience I've ever had. It always has been the most exp important, uh, the most rewarding experience I've ever had. And so from the platform of having set up Project Camelot and then Project Avalon, which were basically whistleblowing websites, now it's about what do we do now? What do we do now that we've known, now that we know we're being lied to? Now that we know what's really going on, now that we know a little bit about who we are, now that we know a little bit about the real history of planet Earth, now what do we do? Or are we just going to sit back like consumers and, like, and kind of watch all this on the internet like some alternative television? That's not the answer. We have to engage in the world, do stuff, fix it, be the change we want to see in the world, and confront absolutely everything that we have done, because we have trashed this beautiful planet. We've trashed this place. It's going to take a while to fix it up. It's going to take two or three generations to repair all the damage. It's repairable. And one of my passions, if there's one thing that I would like to see over the next 30, 40, 50 years, if I'm in a position to see it from wherever I am, I want to see this being repaired this planet is worth it and the human race is worth it. That's my message. At the moment there's a lot of fear uh, on the planet with regards to catastrophes and things collapsing, the financial system collapsing and um, one side of that is you know who's doing all this and that would be the whistleblower side uh, on the information side and but there's people who want to know where can they go, what should they do and it's what would you say to them about where should they go for the next few years? Okay. There are two questions there, I think. And one is about our responses to the concern about bad news, things going wrong, earth changes, earthquakes, financial catastrophes, any kind of catastrophes. And those people who spend a lot of time on the internet know that the internet is full of this stuff. And it's not all crazy, but there's a subtlety going on here that, that, that I want to come back and talk to. So that's one thing that this question is about. Then the other part of that question is, you said, well, what should people do and where should people go? Which taps into what I was saying at the end of my previous question, which is about, okay, we don't just watch this like some kind of reality disaster movie. We've actually got to get on and do something about it. Okay. First uh, the first part of that question is that anyone who's watching this now knows that there are predictions, there are warnings, there are, there are, are prophecies um, made in good faith, people who've received channeled information, leaked information from, from Black Project insiders. We've received this information ourselves saying you know that this might happen and that might happen and this might happen on a certain date and we've all got to be careful and actually at the moment in april 2011 you know what everything's kind of all right it's it's sort of all right now i'm not minimizing some of the things that have really hit a lot of people very hard like the earthquake in japan like um other disasters that have happened elsewhere in the world i'm not being being silly about this, but I'm kind of saying, you know, that the Earth hasn't split in two yet. You know, we haven't got people shooting out. Um, we haven't got gangs roving the streets in 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 downtown New York, killing each other for food because because all the supermarkets are closed and and we have got global famine or something. You know. We aren't in that position. And there's an interesting phenomenon here because many of you watching this may be aware of a very interesting thing that happened which was publicized by Kerry and myself and Project Camelot in October 2008. And we were in Australia at the time attending the Nexus Conference. 
and we got a call from Dr. Bill Deagle uh, early that morning. And Dr. Bill Deagle is an interesting, is an interesting man. I can him as a friend. He's very smart. He's very aware. He's very, uh, very sensitive, and and he's very courageous. And he called us, having lived through a night of visions, as he described it. They weren't dreams. He was experiencing a reality which he was observing that he described as an American city being the victim of, of an atomic blast or an atomic attack of some kind. And he was so shocked by this that he could barely speak. He was, he was almost in tears. This is, a very, this is a brave, tough guy who's seen a lot of stuff and he could barely handle what it was that he lived through that night. And of course, he wanted to, to get this information out about what he'd experienced because he felt that he had a duty to warn people in some way. Now, as we all know, that, that hasn't manifested. And then some people come back to Dr. Bill and they say, well, you know, he's crazy, he's delusional, he's hallucinating, he can't be relied upon as a source of information because, look, he's saying all this stuff and it never happened, we better ignore him. And that may not be fair, because when people write to me and they cite this example and they say, well, that didn't happen, so what do you got to say? You know, kind of, and some people say that in an accusing way, like we're spreading fear in some way, just by reporting this, this, this experience that Dr. Bill Deagle had. And my reply is that how do we know that this hasn't happened on another timeline? It feels to me that that did happen, but rather like if you, if you got several different ways of traveling to a city which is your destination. You can go on several different freeways to get there. And there's a big pileup of cars. There's a huge accident on one of the freeways. But you're on the other one, so you don't experience that. You hear about that on the news later. After you've reached your destination, you realize what happened on the other freeway, which you didn't go on. And this is, this is a very crude example of, of this business of, of, of parallel timelines where there are a number of different ways, maybe even an infinite number of different ways in which we can get from, from our current reality to some future point that we are experiencing. They may even diverge and then come together again. You can imagine this as a kind of flow diagram of alternatives. If any of you have seen the film Sliding Doors with Gwyneth Paltrow um, back in the 1990s, it's a beautiful example of a bifurcation, a split of the timeline into two parallel realities that then later came back together again in a, in a rather special way. It might well be that this is exactly how the universe is constructed. The universe has got plenty of room for all of this stuff to happen in. And I would, I would strongly suggest that what is happening at the moment with a lot of warnings, a lot of anxiety, a lot of prophecies that haven't come true, even information that seems to have been given to contactees and abductees by the ETs who are also watching all this stuff play out. If this doesn't happen or hasn't happened, what it means is it means that we have somehow been smart enough to get ourselves, and this is the, the I that is looking at this video from, from your viewpoint, through your eyes, looking at the whole world. Right now, you are on a timeline that, that is one in which these things haven't happened. And something that Camelot whistleblower Henry Deacon told us, one of the first things that he told us, he was talking about timelines. He said they know about this stuff on the inside. They know about this stuff in black projects. They try and mess around with it using extremely high technology. There are all kinds of tangles going on. But if you've got two timelines, he said, that are very, very close to each other, 
there's a way in which they can interfere and resonate with each other, almost like two high-powered electrical wires, high-voltage electrical wires that are very, very close to each other without total shielding and insulation. Then they're going to interfere with each other. One wire knows that the other wire is there, just a few inches away. And some of these timelines, in that same way, may be very close to, to us. If we're living through a day where something bad happened on another timeline that's just that far away from us, and you have to see this in a kind of multi-dimensional way, we're going to feel pretty weird that day. We're going to feel that, you know, something's going to happen, but it doesn't happen. And then maybe at the end of the day we think, well, I kind of feel that something happened, but nothing happened. This is probably in my own personal opinion, what's going on here. And so, in a condensed way, this is the best summary I can give for people who are worried about stuff, because some of this stuff they're worried about isn't going to happen to them, or may have already happened to them in a different, in a different timeline. At the moment, we may be okay. Now, the second part of the question, is where should people be? Where should people go? What should people do? And a lot of people write to me with that kind of question. They say, you know, should I go to South America? Should I go to Switzerland? Should I go to, 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 to Australia? Where's going to be the safest place to be? And my reply is always that the answer is going to be different for every person because it depends what your purpose is. And this this taps back directly into what I was saying a few minutes ago, that this is the most important question that you can answer for yourself, is what should you be doing? What is it that, that, that fuels your passion, gets you excited, makes you feel on the edge of your seat that you should really be doing something right now? And it might not be about just heading for the hills. It might not be about going to Ecuador and living on a mountainside, um, waiting until, until the coast is clear to come out again. It might be that your mission is to be in the streets of New York or Los Angeles or, or, or Delhi or Cairo or Cape Town or anywhere where you may have a mission to help people. You may need to be in a particular part of the world where there's somebody who you need to meet and work with. There could be any number of answers to that question. And there's no set answer, there really isn't. You have to look within, you have to look at the mirror, and you have to, you have to follow your intuition, because we can't figure this stuff out logically. We really can't follow it out logically. We've got to sort of listen to that voice inside, which does have the answers, whether it's coming from your higher self or something that you always know, you always knew or something that you plan for yourself in this lifetime but you can't quite remember the details you already know this is the thing to tell yourself you already know it's just on the tip of your tongue and stay with it and it will come and if you allow uh, it, it's so hard to explain it, it's like if you look for signs if you look for for clues, if you're alert, if you're aware, if you have a high sensitivity antennae where you're looking for little signs that will tell you things and you notice your own reaction as people say things, look, look for your own reaction as you, as, you, as you coincidentally stumble upon something on Facebook or on the internet or you're watching a television program and somebody says something and then it's suddenly resonating with you. This means something. It means something. And that's the way that the universe around you will, 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 will provide the reflection that you need in order for you to look at that reflection and to figure out what it is that you should be doing. That's where the answers come from. If you were to say, so basically a little summary there would be rather than look for wherever you're going to be the safest and you and your children will survive all this, it would be to say, where am I and my children going to be the most benefit to society? Would that be it, do you think? Exactly, because it, it, depends, it depends what you're here for. If you're here to hide 
until the storm is over, and then come out and then do something, then go hide. And that, uh, uh, and I actually mean that very seriously. That may be the right thing to do. But if you're here to help people, if you're here to form teams, if you're here to, to um, retrain as a paramedic, if you're here to go to Africa to help people there who may be experiencing something that, that we wouldn't want people to experience because we don't want our fellow human beings to experience it. If this is why you're here, then go there and do that. It's not about personal safety. You see, I mean, everything's risky. Every decision you make is risky. You'll never know the answers. Um, birth is risky. Childhood is risky. Getting a job is risky. Marrying someone is risky. Taking a job is risky. Everything is risky. Life is risky. You're not going to get out of it alive. You know, <laughs> everything is risky. So do what you came here for. You're not going to get out of here alive. So do the best job you possibly can do during that time and do the right thing. And one of the little ways to do this, there are all kinds of processes you can do if you're working with somebody about things like this. One of the things which I've done with people sometime is you say, okay, now just imagine you're, you're 90 years old, you're coming to the end of your life, you're not in any pain, you're surrounded by the people who love you, you're surrounded by your children, everything's fine, you know that you're moving on quite soon and you're experiencing a wonderful sense of satisfaction. You, you're looking back over your life and you've done everything that you came here for and your life has been rich and satisfying and filled with everything that you wanted to accomplish when you came here. And then this person who I'm talking with is, is thinking, yeah, okay, I can, I can kind of get into that. And then you say, what did you do? And the answer to that question is whatever it is that you should be doing now because you're not there yet. Right. What would be, do you have an idea of what the big picture is of why all these things are happening right now on the planet? Ah, uh, yeah. This is, this is the subject of a much longer conversation. In order for, for the human race to be lied to, to be, to be controlled, to be dumbed down, to be deprived of our abilities, for our children to be doped up with toxins in their food and their drink, for them to put fluoride in the water that the Nazis used to subdue the prisoners that they had, um, for for us to be to be to be hypnotized by mind-numbing reality shows on television, and for people to be to be to be to be corralled and stupefied and taught in our schools that, um, that, that spiritual abilities don't exist, that we're all animated hunks of meat, that reincarnation is a fantasy, and that everything that happened here is a sort of neo-Darwinist accident. It's like, for the people to put that net in place upon our potential, they must be very afraid of us. They must be very afraid. It's like, in order to apply that much of a knockout cocktail of drugs to a bunch of people, they must be very afraid of what those people would do if they were really allowed to prosper. And once again, this goes back to what it is that I feel so animated about, because, because this needs to be countered, not countered by fighting it. I'm not talking about taking your, your, your pitchforks on the streets. This isn't going to work. Those guys have got billions of dollars, advanced weaponry, and control of the media. You're not going to be able to do it with a force. But you can do it in a different way. You can do it by accessing your potential as an infinite, extraordinary, wonderful, beautiful, inspired, transcendent being. That is who we are, occupying these limited little bodies that are here for just, just a brief candle flame of existence. You know, we are so powerful. What could those magnificent godlike beings do if they all work together in harness to realize their full potential? There's somebody here, there's some people here on planet Earth and probably, very probably, elsewhere who are handling and controlling and manipulating the controllers on planet Earth who do not want that potential to manifest. They don't want you to be who you are. 
asking yourself why, it's a wonderful question. Why? Because of who you could be, what you could do, because of the magnificence that you, that you are. What could this planet be? What could the human race be? What could we all do together? We don't even know the answers to those questions, but we're not being permitted to try. We're not even being permitted to think about it. And so that's the place to go. If there's something we're not being permitted to do, if there's something we're not being permitted to think about, if there's something that's not, we're not being permitted to experience, it must be worth thinking about experiencing and doing. It must be. Why do you think that they're doing that? Why, what are they afraid of? Why are they afraid of it? Or do they have some sort of agenda or profit from having us dumbed down? There, okay, okay, there's a big pause for thought there because here we retreat into the sort of, into the infinite cosmology that I was referring to earlier that isn't about the physical cosmology of the universe, it's about the spiritual cosmology of the universe. There is a, a contest, a game, and when that gets pointed it feels like a battle going on between good and good and evil. It is just a game. As I said in my Freedom Central interview, which I did 18 months ago, it's a paradox. It is a game. At the highest level, nothing matters. It's just, it's just another game, like watching a ball game. Some win, some lose, some people have a hard time, some people are heroes, some people achieve what they want to, some people get carried off the pitch. You know. um, and ultimately it doesn't really matter, because at the end of the game you say, well, that was a great game. At these lowest levels, it starts, to feel, it starts to feel really important. We take it very seriously. And so given that we're here, we're kind of, we're, we're, we're assuming it's important because we might as well. What else is there to do? Um, when, we're, when, we're, when we're playing any game at all, we get into it. We go into the game and we pretend that it's important and we take sides and we have opinions and we, and we argue or in a sport where we're, we're, we're doing everything we can do to try and counter the intentions of the opposition and so on and so forth. But ultimately, it doesn't matter. Now, at the level just below where it doesn't matter, there's a kind of polarization there. Now, this has been in there are there, there there are archetypes here, all throughout culture, through um, through 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 every aspect of religious and spiritual experience for as long as we can remember about what you could call good and evil, about what you could call the forces of darkness and the forces of light. It was um, that archetype was presented in modern times by George Lucas in the Star Wars trilogy. This is why it was so. It was so. Um, this is why it touched so many people, because he was talking about the evil empire and the dark side and the force and the Jedi who were able to reach inside themselves, this small number of people who were able to defeat this, these huge armies because, because of their transcendence and because of how they reached into themselves to access the higher human qualities. So there's something there which is an archetype. It's a game. It's a game that's been set up. It's the greatest game that there is. And when we're inside that game, it feels very serious. And so, at this level, we could just sit and watch it. We could just, just, just pull back from the whole thing and watch the whole thing play out like some kind of entertainment. And some people do that, and that's all right. But if you feel that you have something to do, if you feel that you need to take action, if you feel that you need to to, to, to engage with this, then it means that you're not a spectator. It means that you're a player. And if you're a player on this field, then this is really what I'm talking to. So my passion is coming from this provisional viewpoint that I've kind of created for myself, that it's important. I'm saying, let's pretend this is important. And if this is important, and we're in this game, then here are the opponents, this is what's at stake, this is what we can do, this is how we can work together, here's the plays we can make, and let's go and let's do it. Um, on a different level, 
And there really are people who do this. They pull back from the whole thing and they watch everything from a kind of metaphorical cloud and then they say, well, actually, it's all cool. It's all cool, whatever happens, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter whether the human race destroys itself, it doesn't matter whether the planet blows up, it doesn't matter who wins. And that's true as well. It's a paradox. So you mentioned that people are being dumbed down with um, drugs and with uh, the, the stimuli of programs and all these things, and their bodies are being poisoned to keep them at a very like uh, sleepy mode. What, what, what would you think would happen if a person or a group of people uh, removed all those shackles? What, what would they be able to do, do you think? That's a great question, isn't it? I mean, the snappy answer is to say, I, I mean, the clever answer is to say, well, it has to be worthwhile finding out, you know, give yourself the chance. What can you do? What could you do? But the, the, the way that I present this to somebody is to say that, that to live the life to the maximum of your potential it may not be easy, but it's going to be worth it. And you only know if it's worth it if you try. And you may as well try, because what else are you going to do, unless you're going to be a consumer and a spectator? You may as well try. And there are various ways in which one can work on this. Um, and there are two main parts, of course, to a human being. I mean, one can break it down into all kinds of components, but there are two main parts, and that is that there's you who are the rider of this horse, the driver of this car, the being in the body, what Arthur Kerstler called the ghost in the machine. And there's the body itself. Um, and the body has its own intelligence, it has its own agenda, it has its own mechanics, it's, it's, a, it's largely a physical object, not entirely a physical object, but that's a different question. Um, and there are a lot of things that one can do to, to optimize the body. And optimizing the body will, 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 will help the, the being who is in the body operate at the greatest potential. Simple analogy, it doesn't matter um, uh, whether you're, it, it doesn't matter how good a driver you are. You could be Michael Schumacher, you could be Sterling Moss for old timers. Um, but if you're in an old banger with a clapped out engine um, and the car doesn't work properly, it doesn't matter how good a driver you are, you'll never be able to go anywhere with it. Okay. So you have to have a good vehicle and your body is your vehicle. And so um, my, my advice to any, any friend that I have is don't do drugs, do eat and drink the purest, least polluted food that you possibly can do. If you've got toxins inside you, get them out because they operate like a, like a fog of, 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 of internal suppression on your systems. They really do. There are all kinds of ways in which you can detoxify your body. There are all kinds of ways in which you can you can, you can optimize your body's performance. That will help you. As the Latin saying goes, sana mens in sana corpore, um, a healthy mind and a healthy body. If the body's not healthy, your, your mind can't do the job on its own. Okay. And then there's an enormous raft of personal development techniques that the being can go through. And one of the things that, that is important to understand is that one of the is that the reason why we are operating at a level of 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 debilitation less than our full ability we've we can't do a lot of the things that, that, that spiritual beings can do as human beings. We're kind of limping around in these shackles of 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 amnesia and 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 
so-called paranormal abilities. They're not paranormal, they're normal. Um, but, but ever since we, we came into the physical universe, came into this reality matrix, whatever, whatever words you want to use, we have accumulated so much unfinished business, unhandled stuff, things that happened to us which we haven't processed, things that we've denied rather than facing, responsibilities that we never took, things that we, we, we did and never apologized for. Um, all of this stuff over eons of time, which some people call karma, has left us with this huge amount of baggage that people carry around with them. And this baggage makes us, it makes us tired, it makes us feel small, it makes us feel unable, it makes us kind of permanently feel that we can't do things and we shouldn't do things, we're not good enough to do things. Because we're living with all of this stuff that, that happened to us and which we did to others over, over millions of lifetimes and more. And the reason why I'm saying this is because, in my view, it's impossible to, to, to clean up oneself as a being without going back to look at and process things that one experienced in previous lives. And of course, we've got this kind of firewall that presents us from doing that, because one of the things that's happened to us is we've all got amnesia. Now, that's a very interesting phenomenon. And I don't know where this amnesia comes from, but I have a suspicion that it's got something to do with a sort of, um, <laughs> this is a metaphor, a, a, a sort of electric fence, if you like, that, is, that, it, that corrals us as animals in this field, which is, which is planet Earth, is one of the factors that prevents us from escaping, one of the factors that prevents us from, from from just being able to 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 move out in a metaphorical way to 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 really realize who we could be you see if you wanted to control somebody one of the first things that you do if you had ultimate power if you wanted to control someone one of the first things you do is take away their memory they can't even remember you know they can't remember how to drive their car, they can't remember their bank account, they can't even remember how to talk, they can't remember where they live, they can't remember their name. Um, if you want to disempower somebody, that's a pretty good way to start. So that may be the most fundamental way in which we're all disempowered. And because this sort of happens to all of us, we think that this is normal too. Maybe that's not normal at all. There are a lot of reports from contactees and abductees who've had some kind of communication with ETs, there are many people who do communicate with discarnate beings. Um, there's a lot of channeled information that's nonsense, but some of that channeled information is true. The broad thrust that we get from off-planet entities, whether they're physical or not, is that those beings are very well aware of a whole bunch of stuff. They know who they are. They don't have amnesia. They have the big picture. They can see the big landscape. They know where they fit. They know the rules of the game. They know what the game is. And it would seem that there's something going on that they're trying to tell us without interfering. They're trying to nudge us along. They're trying to do sort of a little bit like what I'm trying to do at the moment, you know. This is my own style of a message that one might get from a spirit guide, if you like, but I'm still a human being. I'm just saying, look, you know, there's more going on than you think. And one of the first things you've got to do is you've got to get your memory back, because that'll help a lot. And as you get your memory back, what tends to happen is one's processing old things that happen to you back in the mists of time. It could be back in the mists of time in the last lifetime. It could be back in the mists of time a zillion lifetimes ago on some other planet. It doesn't actually matter because we carry this stuff with us like balls and chains around our feet that stop us from being able to run and stop us from being able to fly. If you can handle that stuff, you can process it. There are lots of ways to do it. Then that's going to set you free. And it's not a process of... It, 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 in my view, let me say, it's not a process of evolution. 
I believe profoundly that this is a misunderstanding that the alternative media, uh, that the alternative media, that the New Age media have. This idea that we're all kind of evolving somehow. I see it and I kind of put this to you for you to consider, that we are in a devolved state, that a long, long, long time ago, we were in a much more capable, we were, we, were, we were much brighter, we were much more able, we were much more gifted, we were, we were much more aware uh, in every way. And when I say, I'm not talking about, you know, a few thousand years ago. I'm talking about way back in the mists of time when we came into the physical universe as godlike beings wanting to play a game, just like football players coming onto the pitch at the start of the game. That happened a long time ago. We all came onto this pitch and it was such a tough game that what's happening now zillions of years later is that everyone's staggering around on the pitch. They can't remember when it started. They can't remember who they are. They can't remember what they were doing before they got here. They can't remember anything. They're just kind of... <laughs> they're, 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 they're staggering around on the pitch, trying to do the best they can do without even knowing the rules of the game or, 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 or anything about how come they got to be there. And, and so we're in a devolved state and now what we need to do is to retrieve those, those lost abilities, to retrieve those lost memories, to retrieve that lost awareness, to retrieve that lost power. And we're pulling out of a deep dip where the opportunity is to reclaim our, our birthright, is to reclaim our, our, our identity, to know who we are. And that's how we're going to get out of here. So we're, it's like we need to climb out of this big hole that we fell into. With regards to, you mentioned like having memories from other planets. Um, there's a lot of uh, information on the internet about people in experiencing or memories of having come in into their life basically for the first time on the planet. Do you know why this is happening? There seems to be like a huge wave of all these uh, beings coming in and reincarnating into human bodies. Do you have anything to say about that? Absolutely. There are people who, who, who write to me saying, when's the cavalry coming? And I say, well, go look in the mirror. You know. um, there are a lot of extraordinary beings coming in, that's for sure. There are a lot of remarkable children. Um, you may you may, watching this, you may, you may be the parents of some remarkable children. You may have been a remarkable child yourself. You may still be a remarkable child 30 or 40 or 50 years later. There are some very remarkable beings, many of whom have come in with, with enhanced awareness, with their amnesia only partial. Some children come in with, with, with full memories of who they were. And of course, what happens is that those kids are, are they're often uncontrollable, they often uh, have, have, have minds of their own, they, um, other kids are often afraid of them because children kind of want people to be the same as them. They don't like kids who are different. People, it's very interesting. Children can be the cruelest beings to other children that there are. It's not, it's not necessarily children being abused by, by other, either by, by adults. It's children actually being abused by children. There are many, many instances of, of, of children who've had a very hard time at the hands of other children. And, and so there's so many places to go with this because as a parent, if you're watching this, and if, you're, if your child has got invisible, invisible friends, maybe they're not imaginary, maybe they're real. Maybe, maybe you and I can't see them, but maybe they can. If your child is talking about things that they can do or things that they want to do or is talking about strange stuff, maybe this is real. Maybe it's stuff that we don't know about, but they do. Maybe it's not a fantasy. And my plea, I guess, for 
any parents out there is to do everything you can do to support your child in being who they want to be when they're at a very young age. They know. And we between us in this society, we do a, 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 <laughs> we do a staggering job of, of stomping on our children, of telling them that they must conform, of telling them that they mustn't make up stories about things that aren't real, of telling them that if they're different from other kids then they won't have any friends and they've got to do what other kids do in order to be liked and to be normal and to be a good citizen. I mean, this is, this is as, as suppressive as, 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 as any Nazi regime. It, it's, just, it's just got a sugar coating over it that makes us all feel that we're being reasonable. But these children, are coming in with remarkable abilities, with a remarkable sense of purpose. They're coming in all over the world. There's a wonderful book um, written by um, uh, a Chinese researcher um, whose name I can't quite remember at the moment, Paul Zhong, I think, called um, uh, Chinese Super Psychics. I'll put a reference to this on the video. Remarkable stories about children who've come in um, to China ever since the, the, the early 1980s, being able to do all kinds of things. And of course, the Chinese government are very smart and they're, they're working with them to figure out how come these children can do what they do, see what they can learn to try and get them to work for the military and so on and so forth. There are millions of people who've come here for the first time, either from other dimensions, from other realities, from other planets. They're all coming into planet Earth. And this tells you something here. Even though this, this, this proportion is small compared to the 7 billion people we got on this planet, it doesn't need that many in order to start this catalytic chain reaction of awareness, which is already happening. These kids, now many of them are, are they're middle-aged, I guess. Dolores Cannon calls them volunteers. She refers to them as coming in, 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 in several waves. And the first wave, I suppose, is my own generation. I, I'm in my 50s at the moment. Many of you watching this may also be in your 50s. And we're kind of paving the way for these remarkable children to come through. And they're not going to... <laughs> they came here wanting a better world they came here with some sense of who they are. They came here being aware of the fact that a lot of the things they see around them are wrong. They came here wanting to fix things up if they possibly can do. And, 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 and so the cavalry is here, but it's tough for anyone coming here for the first time. This is a tough place to be. It's a tough school. Um, a tiny little story I can tell, which some of you already know, is that I, I came to the West myself uh, from Tibet. I've been in Tibet for about a thousand years or so. And I came to the West in 1850. It, it, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I was born into a very strict Victorian family in England in the year 1850 and I was absolutely smashed. Nothing I'd done in that previous thousand years had equipped me for what happened to me in that Victorian family in 1850 and that life was a disaster. I've been picking myself up since then, I've been recovering my memories, I've been recovering my abilities, I've been handling what happened in that lifetime. It's only a tiny moment of time in the past. Looking back, that was a tough life and it was a, it was a complete failure. Looking back, it was like it's just like having a bad day last week. These things are ephemeral. They do kind of pass. But the reason why I'm just sharing that personal story is that it can be very hard for people coming here for the first time because this is a tough place to be. It's a tough place to hang out. And one of the things um, that, uh, that happens, this is just another way of of reframing what it was that I was saying earlier. David Icke talks about this a lot. He says that the people controlling the planet can't do this on their own. How can a few thousand people control seven billion? They can't. They have to do it with the consent 
of most of the others who are asleep. We've got an, we've got an awful lot of people out there who are operating in an unconscious way, who are, who, are, who, who, are, who are representing this message that you've got to do things in a certain way, that this is what's normal, that this is what's required of you, that they're going to frown on you or disapprove of you, um, or even if you happen to be in law enforcement, they're going to lock you up if you do this, that or the other. Not because they're evil, but because there's a cycle of abuse going on and they're actually the long arm of the controllers. But the people who are actually who are, who, are, who are spearheading this are a relatively small number. And the point that David Icke makes um, totally correctly, in my view, is that they can't do this without the compliance of a lot of people who are actually operating, operating on their behalf. So basically they're keeping the masses asleep and then influencing their agreement, right? Would that be...? Absolutely right. Right. Absolutely right. I'm interested in um, a little bit about uh, the view of David Icke's um, behind who are the rulers of the planet and also some other information that you've received. What do you think makes them uh, so able to do it? I mean, are they people who haven't forgotten, who, who do have their abilities? Uh, what's, what's going on there? <laughs> Good or are question. Are they reptilians <laughs> or pure humans? <laughs> Great question. I don't know the answers to those questions, but there's an enormous amount of evidence that points to the fact that, uh, uh, and it's well documented by anyone who, 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 who picks up these string trails and follow them, they follow the data trail to wherever it goes, that there are a relatively small number of insiders who do know what's going on. They do know the history of planet Earth. They do have the documentation. They, they do have the esoteric knowledge they have esoteric knowledge that is directly connected to being able to liberate those suppressed abilities and use them to evil ends. It's called black magic. There's, there is such a thing as magic. This isn't just, just, just fanciful Harry Potter nonsense. There is black magic and there is white magic. And, and, and all of these things are kind of scoffed at, but the insiders take them very, very seriously. And it's, and it's a question just like any other ability at all. The surgeon's knife can be used to kill or cure. Magic can be used to liberate or to enslave. It just depends on the intentions of whoever it is who's wielding the instrument. So on the inside, they, 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 they have a lot of esoteric knowledge that's been passed down for thousands of years. They have hidden libraries of books which contain history and, 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 and access to this, to this information that empowers them because knowledge is power and this is why we don't have that knowledge because we're not being allowed to know who we are. The insiders, I believe, know exactly who they are, they know where they came from, they know what it is that they're doing and there's a really good reason why they don't want other people to know. It's all about, it's all about control. I'm sick and tired of hearing things from uptight, short-sighted, narrow-minded hypocrites. All I want is the truth. Just give me some truth. I've had enough of reading things by neurotic, psychotic, big-headed politicians. But by, but by supporting those individuals in really accessing their potential, and this, this is a kind of nod back to what in the, the 60s and 70s used to be called the, the human potential movement. It's a great name. Um, I was really working on, at, at the tail end of that. I was surfing on that wave. I had a lot of personal experiences at that time that, really, uh, that I really learned an awful lot from. And I did everything I could do to pass this on. So although I was working in the corporate world, this was what I was doing in a, in a kind of stealth mode, was I was working directly with these individuals to help them develop themselves in extraordinary ways. And, 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 and this has always been my passion, to be an educator. When I was, uh, I can't remember, when I was 21 or 22 or something, after I left university, I became a school teacher for, for a couple of years, which was... Uh, 
<laughs> which didn't work out at all. I, I realized very quickly that I was an indirect bastion of the establishment, that what schools were, were there were just ways of, of, of institutionalize, institutionalizing and socializing children to be obedient and to conform and to think in certain regimented ways. Whatever schools might think, somebody, usually people who are successful in the education system, are people who've learnt to behave in a certain way. They get rewarded for that, just like Pavlov's dogs, and then they're actually being groomed to go into mainstream society and do everything that mainstream society wants. The kids who question things, the, the kids who are disobedient, the kids who are overly creative, the kids who want to do things in their own way, who are, are, are spirited and strong and, and, and maverick, are not usually the kids who are rewarded by the school system. I saw this at first hand. I got out of the school system as fast as I possibly could do because I was with those kids who were doing that. I was rooting for them all the way. And um, for a while I was confused because I had this passion to be an educator and yet I thought, well, here I am being an educator and this isn't what I came here for. And I even felt bad about it for a little while because I just kind of ran out of the door. I didn't want to have anything to do with the school system. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I don't have the courage, maybe I don't have the strength, maybe I should hang in there like, like, like some teachers do. And that was another way in which I came full circle, because years later I was working with people in what I would call a real, really educating themselves, not in terms of stuffing them with information like Christmas turkeys, but by inspiring them to, to do the things that schools don't teach, which is how to work with people, how to solve problems, how to be creative, how to, how to reach inside themselves, to access the higher human abilities. Um, and we used to do this using uh, outdoor activities and team building games and we used to set up whole kind of micro universes of, 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 of challenge and fun and problem solving and working together that would sometimes last several days. Um, like they'd have a start and they'd go into this whole imaginary role play drama and then they'd come out of it and then we'd all sit around eating tea and cakes and we'd talk about all of this and then they'd 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 share what they'd learned they talk and so something that excites me and it's important to say that because if somebody's talking to me and they say well what should I do with my life I reflect that back to them and I say well what is it that you're passionate about what do you get excited about what do you wake up in the morning thinking about what do you care about what do you talk about to anyone who's willing to listen and that'll give you a clue as to what it is you should be doing and what it is that excites me, and what it is that gets me up in the morning, and, and, and what it is that I want to talk about, what it is that I want to talk about now, is, is, is it's about what is it that, that, that we can do together where we can get the synergy, we can, we can extract the potential synergy of people working together, people inspiring each other, people working in... In, 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 in teams and alliances and networks all over the world. We don't have billions of dollars, but we may have something else. We may have, we may have a lot of forces behind us. We may have a lot of benevolent forces behind us. We may have something that, for lack of any better word, you could call the human spirit, which, if, it is, if, it's, if, it's, if it's properly harnessed, and when I say harnessed, I, I'm talking about the idea of, of a whole bunch of horses pulling a carriage harnessed together in the same direction. Mm -hmm. If this is harnessed, then we have a lot of power there. And one of the things that's going on in the alternative media, the alternative community, is that there's a lot of division, there's a lot of fragmentation. There are um, a lot of people who are pulling in different directions, not working as efficiently as they could do. I want to get people working together. I want to support that process. I want to energize and inspire individuals. And so that's, that's where I am right now. Now, you asked me a few minutes ago about 
what it was that I was doing quite a long time ago. Because some people are saying, well, how come Bill Ryan has changed his direction? Well, Bill Ryan hasn't changed his direction at all. Bill Ryan was doing this quite a long time ago. Because I used to run um, team building, team development, personal development, executive training courses. It's, it's all in a kind of big, big, big box of stuff that's closely related together. Back in the, in the early 1980s, I started doing this work. And I was working with teams of managers and executives, and sometimes young people as well, in business and industry in the UK. But I wasn't wearing a suit and tie. I was operating very informally. This was working as an opportunity to work with, with, with individuals to help them become, for, for lack of a better word, to help them become better people or to help them to become the people that they wanted to become, that they knew was inside them. It wasn't about fulfilling any corporate agenda, but it was about at the end of a five or a six day program, if somebody went back, went home at the end of that week and they became, or they realized that they were able to be a better husband, a better wife, a better mother, a better father, a better son, a better daughter, better employer, a better citizen, um, because there was something inside them that was operating to a much richer potential, what some people might these days, dare I say it, call a higher vibration, then everybody wins. Um, we weren't necessarily working to a specific goal. They were confused, we have been lied to, we're having information withheld from us and altered by the mainstream media. Our governments want to keep us in the dark for all kinds of interesting reasons. Many people watching this will be totally aware of that. And so Project Camelot, founded five years ago, was a whistleblowing website. And that's just a, 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 a condensed form for, of, of saying that we wanted to present as much truth laid out on this big buffet table of all these things that you can help yourself to. You can look at this, you can talk about super soldiers, you can look at the, the Mars base, you can look at indigo children, you can look at paranormal abilities, you can look at what may have happened back with the Roswell incident. You can look at the whole thing. And the idea was to present this, this sort of huge mosaic of information, which was, which, um, most of which you wouldn't find in one, in one place, in a kind of one-stop shop, as it were. So this was the informational mission that Kerry Casty and myself had. And we've got hundreds of hours of video out there on the internet. We've actually, we've, we've lost count. Between us now, it must be over 200 hours of testimony from some very high quality people, some very interesting people, some very smart people, some very controversial people, some very startling information. And we presented this all saying, look, look at all of this. You won't see this stuff on CNN. It wasn't the only place you could find it, but we wanted to put it all in one place for people. Okay. Now, as long ago as two years ago, Carrie Cassidy and I were talking about the fact that maybe our work was pretty much done in the sense that maybe there are details of this information which, uh, which, which you could drill down further into forever is necessary. Even now, for example, on the 9-11 forums and the 9-11 websites, you have people arguing and discussing and debating with each other about what it was that hit the Pentagon and what it was that took down the the two towers, uh, the, the twin towers, was it was it thermite or thermate or a, or a space-based weapon or what? And actually, that's interesting, and we need to get to the bottom of that information in the end, but maybe in the big picture it's not that important. The fact is it was a false flag event. That's all you need to know in order to move on, to take that jigsaw puzzle piece, and then to, and then to fit that into the big mosaic of what is going on on this planet, why are we being lied to, who are we, why are they doing to this to us? And, 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 and what is our position in the cosmos here that makes it so important for us to be dumbed down, lied to, controlled and suppressed every minute of every day? Why would they do that? It's a very, very valuable question to ask. So, what I'm saying there is that we've got enough information out there already, and there's a lot on the, inf on the internet. There are many people who are doing this work. Um, it's quite confusing, but a lot of the information is already out there. So now what we want is inspiration. People need 
to get in touch with their missions, they need to get in touch with their energy, they need to get in touch with the reason why they're here on this planet. Why do they incarnate here this lifetime? There are many people who write to us. They know that there's something about themselves that they can't quite remember, that they can't quite get in touch with. They know that, uh, that they're here on a mission for a purpose and they can't quite remember what it was. They feel energized, they feel that there's something they have to do. And there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are in this position. Many of them write to us. My, um, when I was eight, nine, ten, throughout my teenage years, I would devour books on the, the paranormal. I used to get them out of the library. I saved up my pocket money to read Eric von Däniken's Chariots of the Gods. Many of you watching this will maybe identify with that if that was one of your first books to, to really point at the fact that there's some very strange things that have happened on planet Earth that are just swept aside by the mainstream media. And certainly by the time I was, I was a young teenager, it was very obvious to me that we weren't being told the truth. And I was so curious, I wanted to know about everything. And I was, um, when I was about 14 or 15, I decided that I wanted to be an astrophysicist because I figured out that the way to find out about life, the universe and everything and why we're all here and what's going on and why is there anything happening anyway was to look through a telescope and to figure out the, the basic principles of cosmology. I thought if you look through a telescope and did a lot of math then you can get all the answers. Uh, following on from Einstein and the quantum physicists and the, um, and, and, and the great cosmologists and astrophysicists of the time, Fred Hoyle was a hero of mine, and so on and so forth. So that's how come I ended up studying math and I went to university to study math and then I realized when I was at university that what one has to do is you've got to turn the telescope around. This is a metaphor. You turn the telescope around, you don't look outside to get the answers, you look inside. Because um, as uh, Cat Stevens sang, the answer lies within, not out there at the other end of a telescope. And so that then started my own journey, and this was something that will resonate with a lot of people watching this. That started my journey, which was a kind of personal development journey, a spiritual growth journey that, um, that really led me to follow the string trail of, of who I was. Who is this being who I call I, who's looking out from my eyes into the universe, this, this viewpoint, this platform that absorbs information and looks out, who is that? Where does it come from? What's the difference between me and all the other people who have the same experience looking out from, from their eyes? How did all of that happen? And what's the relationship between that and everything that we see out there in the cosmos when we look out through our telescope. And kind of marrying this sort of, this, this, this personal spiritual picture, all of those big internal questions, with all of those big external questions, has been a thread that's run through my life, I guess, and has taken me right through until the present moment. You mentioned before um, that you had actually worked for quite a long time um, inspiring people before you got involved in the alternative media. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because there are one or two um, people who are sort of surprised, if you like, at, a, at a, a point which I've reached now. This is, this is April 2011. And this is something which I would like this interview to be at least partially about which is that having founded Project Camelot with Kerry Cassidy in, uh, in April 2006, pretty much exactly five years ago, that was all about providing information for people because people were starved of information. I'm sick and tired of hearing things from uptight, short-sighted, narrow-minded hypocrites. All I want is the truth. Just give me some truth I've had enough of reading things by new product psychotic big It's the 20th of April 2011 and I'm here with Bill Ryan from Project Avalon and we're going to do an interview 
about his life and his goals and his vision for the planet. So Bill, can you tell me a little bit about your early years? A little bit about my early years? Okay. I'll give you the compressed version. Um, I'm, I'm British, I was born in London, I was taken off to West Africa by my parents at, as a babe in arms. And I had a wonderful, exotic, tropical upbringing until I was about eight years old, where when I was driving through the rainforest in the back of my dad's Land Rover, watching the monkeys swinging from the trees, I thought that all this was normal. And that kind of spirit of adventure, the love of the great outdoors, the love of the forest, the love of the animals, the love of exotic places, and the love of Africa, actually, has never really left me since then. It was a very formative experience. And um, I went back to England when I was eight years old, basically, to get my education, because up until then I hadn't done anything at all. I, was, I went to school in a few little tiny places, didn't really learn much. I used to read a lot, um, but I didn't actually receive any formal schooling. So my education started in England when I was eight years old. And uh, since then I've loved to return to Africa at every possible opportunity for any reason or, or no reason. And those of you who've been there uh, may understand that. So what else would you like to know? You need to guide me through here, otherwise I'll talk for hours about my childhood. Right. Uh, well, I'd I'm really interested in what age or who influenced you to look beyond what's rare, what people will con consider to be real within the culture that we're living in, to look beyond and see the bigger picture? Okay. The simple answer to that is I don't know, but it's always been with me. I've always questioned things. I was always curious, even as a little boy, in, in, in interesting stories, stories of the unexplained. I was very open-minded about all kinds of things. I remember when I was a little five-year-old boy, I used to climb a tree in the garden in Ghana, in West Africa, and I used to pretend that this was my spaceship. And when I was eight years old, this is a funny little story, when I was eight years old um, and I went back to school, went to school in England, the teacher asked us all to write a story and all the other little children were writing stories about their puppy dog or their day by the seaside. And young Bill Ryan, eight years old, wanted to write about ghosts and flying saucers. And my teacher wouldn't let me. And so <laughs> this was my first experience of the cover-up. It, right. it was quite interesting. I had no idea why I wanted to write about ghosts and flying saucers when I was eight years old. I don't know what I knew. I probably didn't know anything, but I know that I was enthusiastic. I really wanted to write something, this little kid wanting to communicate to the world, and my teacher stopped me. Uh, didn't stop my interest, though, because all throughout um, 